Join us now for Education Matters, a weekly look at the real people and real stories in education across North Carolina. Welcome to another episode of Education Matters presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Keith Poston. Tonight's show we're calling Newsmakers and Newsbreakers. We'll have a newsmaker up first. Today it's the state's budget director, Charlie Perus, followed with a, by a discussion with newsbreakers, reporters who cover education every day. Should be a great discussion. Like every week before we tackle the main topic, we'll open with our segment we call Headlines. It's a quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. Last week, Governor Roy Cooper released his first state budget and transmitted it to the North Carolina General Assembly. This formally kicks off what is typically a month-long process to arrive at a new two-year budget for the state. We have his budget director up next, so we'll dig in more with him about the details of the governor's proposals on education. We've been reporting for a few months now about troubles at Kestrel Heights, a charter school in Durham. Last week, the State Board of Education voted unanimously to close Kestrel's high school because the school awarded diplomas to students who didn't meet state requirements for graduation. Kestrel will be allowed to continue operating its kindergarten to eighth grade school. Kestrel has been under intense scrutiny since an internal investigation found that 160 of Kestrel's 399 graduates since 2008 didn't meet the state's requirements for a diploma. North Carolina school leaders are growing worried that state lawmakers won't soften a mandated reduction in class sizes that could lead to cuts in art, music, and physical education classes. That means hundreds of teachers are in limbo about their job next school year and parents and students are uncertain about the fate of these programs at their schools. The State House unanimously passed House Bill 13 after school districts warned they might have to cut arts and PE classes to help pay for new class size limits in kindergarten through third grade this fall. But the legislation, which reduces but doesn't eliminate the class size cuts, has stalled in the Senate. School leaders say they have to plan for the worst because they're not sure if and when the General Assembly may act on class size. Finally, Donald Trump visited his first school since becoming president, and it was a private Catholic school in Florida. That, that school, St. Andrew's Catholic School in Orlando, has been heralded by President Trump and Education Secretary Betsy DeVos for its participation in Florida's private school choice program. On the campaign trail, President Trump talked about an ambitious $20 billion school voucher plan that would allow students to use federal education dollars to attend private schools. North Carolina's Opportunity Scholarship Program does the same thing with North Carolina taxpayer dollars. Trump's big push for private school, comes, private school choice comes at a time when several recent studies cast doubt on the quality and accountability of these initiatives. We'll continue talking about private school vouchers in future episodes. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum's website at ncforum.org, click Education Matters, and read more about each of these headlines as well as other topics we cover each week. As I said at the top of the show, today is Newsmakers and Newsbreakers, and our newsmaker today is Charlie Peruse. Charlie is the state's budget director, the Office of State Budget and Management in North Carolina. Thanks, Charlie, for being here. Glad to be here, Keith. Thanks. All right. Um, we know from the governor's uh, almost a, sort of a barnstorming tour across the state that education is a big part of his first budget that he's proposed as becoming governor. So I guess right off the top, just kind of give me... Give me the top line. So what's the governor uh, want to do and see happen in uh, the budget for education? The governor has set out a bold, exciting, and bipartisan vision for education in North Carolina with one main goal, making North Carolina a top 10 educated state by 2025. What does that mean? Investments in early education, improving high school graduation rates, in the number of adults that have a two-year or four-year degree. Right now, North Carolina is a middle-pack state in these areas, you know, ranking 24th or 25th, and the governor wants us to be in the top 10 by 2025. Right. Now, and obviously, uh, you know, one of the biggest line items for the state's education budget goes to salaries, um, not just teachers but school administrators. Mm -hmm. what, what specifically is in the governor's budget that he's proposing, and we'll get in a little bit about how this process is gonna roll out, but for teachers and for principals. The governor's budget outlines the largest teacher pay increase in over a decade, specifically includes a 5% average increase in 17-18, and an additional 5% increase in 18-19, an investment of over $500 million over two years. With the goal of being best in the Southeast, 
after three years and to the teacher national average of salaries by five years. Right. What about school administrators? School administrators would receive an average six and a half percent increase in the governor's budget. Now, um, I mean, these are, um, um, these are ambitious goals, uh, getting to uh, tops in the southeast, um, getting to the national average. Uh, why, does, um, why does the governor think it's important to, to put that kind of emphasis in his budget? Quality educators is a hallmark for improving student success. Uh, I think the governor believes that, that education is not a, a Republican or a Democratic value. It's a North Carolina value. And one of those is paying teachers what they're worth. Having good teachers in the classroom uh, that want to be there, uh, that want to stay, improves student outcomes. Right. Now, uh, here at, at Education Matters, we think that uh, you know, investing in education is not a, a partisan issue, too. Um, but, um, but let's talk about it. But we obviously live in a political partisan world. What do you think is going to happen? Um, you know, you've, you've already been able, you've been over at the General Assembly, I think you presented last week. Yes, um, what do you expect to happen um, and what kind of response are you getting already? We're hearing great feedback from leaders and members of the General Assembly about the governor's budget. Uh, we rolled out last Thursday to full appropriations and in individual conversations. We're hearing that there are many areas of bipartisan support. Several folks have said, you know, Charlie, the governor's budget, I like 90 to 95 percent of it. I think that's a good starting point for North Carolina. Oh, I think that's a great starting point. I mean, look, we know um, uh, your pre the governor's predecessor, Pat McCrory, didn't always uh, uh, enjoy that much agreement on his budget. So those are those are good comments to hear. What? Um, uh, but what sort of what do you where do you think that some of the um, departures are going to be? I think um, we mentioned in the headlines we talked about uh, private school vouchers. Uh, the, the governor has taken a different uh, position on opportunity scholarship program. Yeah, the governor takes a middle of the road approach on opportunity scholarships. The legislature has already put in twenty five million dollars in the base budget for opportunity scholarships. The governor keeps that adds a few million more in 17, 18, and 18, 19 to basically allow all students who have an opportunity scholarship in the 17, 18 school year to continue to have them, but starting in 18, 19, no additional ones are funded. Right. Um, bigger, sort of a bigger picture question, looking at state government just in general here in North Carolina, what do you um, see as the biggest challenge right now for um, state government? Well, I think investing in our people. Um, you know, North Carolina's economy has finally started to catch up to the nation starting about a year ago. Um, we've had some investment, but limited investment in education and other core government services. Keith, North Carolina grows 110,000 people every year. Wow. That's equivalent to a city of High Point. And so to keep up with that growth and just inflation, uh, we have to invest in our people, and we think the governor's budget strikes the right balance of investing in education and other core services while continuing to live within our means. Now, does, um, I, I believe if I'm correct, the governor's budget does not include any new um, taxes, but it also doesn't include any rollbacks of some. And there's been some back and forth on that. Uh, sort of where, how, where did that internal sort of discussion go as far as revenues? Is there enough to do what we need to do? We believe so. No new taxes, no new fees, no borrowing from special funds, no gimmicks. Mm -hmm. uh, this budget is structurally sound and lives within the means while making critical investments that we believe will help North Carolina move forward. Did you, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've been um, uh, working in state government for a, a while. Uh, yes, so you know a lot of the, pr the, the prior agency heads, uh, uh, both under Governor McCrory and previous administrations. They give you uh, uh, sort of any input or um, thoughts on as you were putting this together. It was kind of a little bit of a compressed schedule, I guess, because of the uh, uh, election yes. recounts and things. But sort of where did that come from? Who do, you know, who do you talk to, you know, when, you're, when the, the team is working on the budget? Well, obviously we met right after the new year with the governor to understand his vision and in priorities uh, f for his term and, and where he wanted us to go. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we met individually with each agency head, cabinet secretary and council of state member at least once and sometimes twice to understand their priorities. And I believe across the board, we have put the top two or three priorities from each of the agencies in the governor's budget. Terrific. So you've got coming up next week, uh, the governor addresses the General Assembly, State of the State, and then this 
the process has really started now for the budget. That's correct. Terrific. Look, we really appreciate you coming on the show. We'll hope to have you have you back so we can talk a little bit more about this. We're just getting started. It's March. It's March Madness, um, and uh, but we'll be going through the summer um, talking about budget. But thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, our newsbreakers join us. But first, as we go to break, see if you can answer this question. What percentage of public school funding is provided by the state? Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer C, 65%? Today, 65% of the funds for your public schools come from the state of North Carolina, with the remaining coming from the federal government, 25%, primarily for a free and reduced school lunch and Title I funding for high poverty schools, and about 10% from local county funding. Now let's welcome our two reporters who cover education and policy every day. Thank you for both being here. We've got first, we've got Mark Binker, from WRL News. You probably see Mark, um, if you're a regular REL viewer, standing next to his colleague Laura Leslie down at the General Assembly. So we know you're down there a lot. So we're going to talk to you about the budget. And then we've got Lynn Bonner. Lynn is with the News and Observer, um, uh, based in Raleigh, uh, covers education and other policy issues for the newspaper. So Lynn, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to start with you, Mark. Um, since you're at the legislature uh, pretty much every day when they're in session, you just heard uh, uh, the, the state budget director talk about his budget and that it's, it sounds like they love it. Is that uh, <laughs> sort of what's going on uh, in the legislature? It, it didn't exactly open to rave reviews. I, I, I think the biggest difference was sort of in total size. Governor Cooper is proposing a total budget that's bigger than where uh, House and Senate leaders want to be, and you saw sort of the initial reactions from budget chairman saying, that's that's maybe a percentage point or two higher of, uh, than where we're going to go. Um, the other interesting thing with regards to education, you know, Governor Cooper essentially said what lawmakers said going into the session, hey, we'd like to get average teacher salary to $55,000, and that's you know, almost verbatim what legislative leaders have been right. saying. So, of course, they immediately fought about that point and, <laughs> and how they were getting there. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's sort of some signs of, 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 you know, them getting along, but there's also just the normal kind of prerogatives as governor versus legislature that they're, they're quarreling with each other already, too. Yeah, so, so what are you watching as it sort of, lifts, as it sort of starts to heat up? I mean, sort of what, what, are the, how do you, what, what are the tea leaves you're reading down there? Um, yeah, but right now we're, we're watching lawmakers very carefully pick through uh, the, the, both the governor's budget and, and the continuation budget, and, and, and they are maybe taking a little bit longer run up this year than they have before. Um, by this point in the session, I think, and Lynn can correct me, they've, they're usually done with these joint kind of educational meetings and moved on to one chamber or the other beginning construction on the budget, and they are continuing these joint meetings between the House and Senate to maybe really get into the gears of the budget right, right. now. So what about that, Lynn? Sort of where, um, what are you, you know, so what are you seeing and what are you watching for, listing for as the budget starts? Well, one of the biggest disconnects is over private school vouchers. Uh, the governor wants to phase out the program. The legislature has said they want to continue growth. Um, so that is something that we already know they disagree on. Ten million a year for the next decade, right? Exactly. More, more exactly. On top of and uh, the opposite of, of a phase out. <laughs> uh, so we're th looking at that. Also, with so the uh, voucher supporters coming out with more Democrats, uh, African American Democrats, saying they support vouchers and home schools. So the political dynamic is starting to change just slightly. One of the disconnects I find with the budget and some of the discussions, you know, I cover policy as well, right. is um, we've get gotten really kind of consistent reports on the side of the State Board of Education about uh, high, uh, highly effective teachers not staying in uh, struggling schools and the difficulty in keeping um, those teachers and highly effective principals in struggling schools and what to do about that. Um, there seems to be some sort of disconnect between what they know, what the data shows, and uh, people who can set policy and make laws on how to solve that problem so that there are fewer uh, DNF schools uh, potentially because teachers have an incentive to stay in those schools. Right. Um, 
Mark, it always think when the budget, uh, when it comes to education, there's usually something that's uh, a couple of hot ones. Obviously, teacher pay is always going to be there, but teacher's assistance was kind of the thing uh, uh, two or three years ago. That seems, at least so far, I haven't heard much about that, but it's this, this, this class size issue is looming large, we hear from school leaders. Yeah, and, and this was something that was meant well last year where the legislature said, gosh, we gave you sort of a direction to head in terms of class size, and we're not seeing you get there. So we really mean it. We're, we're going we're gonna to have this smaller ratio of students to teachers in the classroom. Um, that sort of had a domino effect. Uh, there are other parts of the budget. You know, there's sort of a difference between your class size and your class allotment. I mean, there, it's just sort of a bureaucratic difference that, you know, if you sat down to read it as a regular human being, you wouldn't notice. <laughs> but uh, when you sit down to read it as an education bureaucrat, you're like, oh, well, holy cow, we're, we're now losing the flexibility to hire an art teacher or a gym teacher. Right. Um, that message got through, I think, loud and clear to the state house, which has already, as you mentioned earlier, passed a bill to kind of fix this problem, at least for the short term. I think the Senate is much more skeptical of it just because sort of the historical, I mean, this is a bad word to use, but sort of jury rigging of how it was mm -hmm. done is just sort of done in shorthand and never really spelled out. Um, they're, they're saying, well, why doesn't, you know, 1 to 16, 1 to 18 mean 1 to 16, 1 to 18? Why, why is this a bigger number? Right. Now, now Lynn, you're, and you're right here in Wake County. I know right. that the uh, school superintendent here has weighed in publicly about this issue. Exactly. Now, is one of your, I mean, I know you've got, there's a local reporter here, Kern, mm -hmm. we, who, who, does, who does the, uh, but you try to translate these policy things to Wake County families, too. How do you sort of go about trying to do that on something like this? Well, what uh, they're struggling with is, okay, well, we have to have this hard cap. So what does it mean for what a classroom might look like? Uh, is there are there going to be divided classrooms? Uh, do we have to do they have to have more mobile classrooms? Uh, how quickly do we have to put those in place? Um, is there going to be um, gym or music? Uh, are there going to be larger class sizes in middle school and high school? Um, that's a lot of the, those are a lot of things that have to be examined and looked at when you consider a uh, change where there are going to be more considerably more uh, K three teachers. Right. Is that yeah. what you're well, uh, well, in Wake County, one of the things they're struggling with is okay. We, if we do this, where are we going to conjure four hundred additional classrooms from? Right. So it's not just I, it's not just the teachers. It's actually the, the it's space, physical the, the space. Actual rooms. Uh, and then you multiply that over counties, over counties, over counties across the state, and all of a sudden, you know, all those counties are going out to say mobile classroom suppliers at the same time. And those mobile classroom, man, we're getting a lot of orders. So you know. There, there are just some physical things that, that uh, uh, compromise this reality as well as philosophical. Right. We're almost out of time, but let me, for, for both of you, real quickly, what should we be watching for? What are the sort of the, what are you watching? And if you care about education, what are the big bills? Well, the big bill uh, right now is that uh, class size bill. How quickly, uh, if at all, if the Senate moves on it and what the schools do to respond. Mark? Uh, overall, it's, it's education. Can the governor and the legislature get what they want in terms of teacher funding as well as come to some sort of agreement on these uh, school choice issues like uh, vouchers and like charter schools where there's just some, you know, not the monetary disagreement may not be huge, but the philosophical disagreement is pretty right. big. Thank you both for being here. You guys are great. We love what you do to help uh, to keep us informed about what's happening in education and policy. So thanks so much. When we come back, this week's Leadership Spotlight. Each week, Education Matters spotlights individuals demonstrating exceptional leadership in education in North Carolina based on nominations from you, our viewers. This week, we spotlight Michael West at Wendell Middle School in Wake County. Leadership Spotlight is presented by the NC STEM Center, strategies that engage minds. We have a student news program here. Good morning, Wendell Wolves. I'm Danielle. And I'm Sam. Welcome to this week's update. We decided to do a, a weekly format and have the kids stress their work on the production and the writing and the planning that goes into a production like this. The stuff that people don't see is often it takes the most work. Technology is not 
a learning goal, it's a avenue through which we get learning goals. My goal with teachers and students is how can I use technology to make their jobs in, in their respective fields. Like, how, does, how do I make that easier, more effective, more engaging, um, and more efficient? Giving kids the opportunity to create and develop you know, skills around communication, collaboration, critical thinking, uh, all of these, all these things that I think traditional schooling models, you know, schooling does not look like in our mind's eye many times, using the iPads to create advertisements or using green screens. Uh, so I think helping teachers and students meet somewhere in the middle, technology to me is about being culturally responsive. Youth is a component of culture and I think technology is a huge part of that culture. I think we spend so much time in public education trying to fix individual fish, but if you see a fish in a lake belly up and you notice that, that something's wrong with that fish, and so you're going to probably use tools and tactics that are going to try to address the problems that you think are inherent with the fish. What I think we should do more of in public education is start examining the water. Anytime you can involve kids in the process of their own learning and give them a sense of, of, of autonomy and power in their uh, experience here, is, uh, that's, that's the gold standard for, in my opinion. If you know someone who deserves to be recognized, visit our website, ncforum.org, and click on Education Matters, and you'll find a link to nominate someone in your community. After the break, this week's final word. As we discussed, we are really just at the beginning of what will likely be several months of budget wrangling. This process will no doubt include negotiations back and forth, some fierce fights, and even the occasional name calling. And that's just between the House and the Senate. I am quite sure the State Budget Director, Charlie Perus, who joined us today, knows there are many tough battles to be fought over the governor's proposed budget. With Republicans enjoying veto-proof majorities in the General Assembly, they really don't have to, uh, to compromise at all with Democratic Governor Roy Cooper. Here's what I encourage our viewers to do. Take a look at the governor's proposed budget information. We'll have links on our website to the basic materials. The address is ncforum.org, and look for the resources section for today's show. But after that, I want you to take a look at what will be introduced soon by the North Carolina Senate. We'll share all those links and information, too. You really won't have to look terribly hard to find areas, on paper anyway, where it looks like the governor and the legislature ought to be able to work together. Those areas include continuing to raise teacher pay and to, increase, to address our incredibly low school principal and assistant principal pay. There's also likely some areas of agreement to invest more in early childhood programs to help get our children ready for school and to focus on third grade reading level when they get there as a critical predictor for future success. There are policy areas that will be vigorously debated, like continuing to expand the private school voucher program and what our school funding system ought to look like going forward. But I encourage not just our viewers, but our state's leaders to keep the focus on the students and what's best for them. Our state constitution guarantees a sound basic education for all our children, and the courts found that the elements needed to deliver a sound basic education are an effective teacher in every classroom, a great principal in every school, and adequate resources for those schools. If you ask me, that seems like a pretty good checklist to have handy when you're assessing whether a budget or a budget line item is taking North Carolina where it must go when it comes to education. That's it for this week's Education Matters. Next week, we're going to focus further on school funding as the General Assembly explores how our schools are funded, and we're going to take another look at the K-3 class size issue we talked about today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.